digital acquirers. Thank you, Monica. So a really exciting panel, and I'm looking forward to speaking to, to all of them today. Um, I'm sure everyone's familiar with Zoom by now, probably too familiar with Zoom. Um, I would suggest there's a lot of us online today. So if everyone puts themselves into speaker view, that should mean that you, you will see the person who's speaking. Um, before I turn to the panel, I want to offer some of my observations. Um, I thought I put my teeth in. Um, I want to make sure that today is interactive. So if you've got any thoughts, reflections, questions, please put those into the chat. Um, I'm being supported by Millie this morning and she's going to be monitoring the chat throughout um, and at appropriate times we'll be either drawing together some themes or asking some tricky questions if we've got any. So please do use that. Um, Today is about connecting in the new normal. Um, nobody likes the term new normal. Um, I couldn't think of a better one. Um, I could perhaps have called this business development in slippers. Um, but either way, it's about relationships. So before I start to make sure that everyone's energized and with us, I just want to do a quick poll with two questions. So the first question is, have you found sustaining existing relationships harder? And the answers there are yes, no, or the same. So that's existing relationships. So answers coming in now, I'll share those with you when, when we get everyone. About 10% of people still to vote. So that's really interesting. So I'll end polling and remember to share the results, which I always forget to do. So interestingly, online, 43% of you are actually finding sustaining existing relationships harder. Uh, some of you are finding it either, you know, no or, you know, the same as it was before. So that's great. So the second question then is, uh, if I can work out how to do it, um, are you finding creating new relationships more difficult? So this is new relationships. Again, more coming through and I'll stop the polling there. Really interesting results. Thanks for taking part. So yeah, interestingly, but perhaps not surprisingly, you know, the majority of people are online are finding it more difficult to create new relationships. Um, and I'm not surprised by that. And um, a recent online survey of representatives of professional services firms, 70% of people said that they were worried about doing business development with people working from home. I recently spoke at a conference and again, the, you know, the comments that I was getting from everyone was, you know, it's much harder to do business development. It's much harder to develop that pipeline. And that's why I decided to host the event today. And hopefully through the conversations, we'll get some insights into what people are finding difficult. Um, and we'll hopefully get some thoughts on what might work as well. So I think when we think about the customer journey, I know some people think of sales funnels, some people think of flywheels, but either way, there tends to be a division between marketing and business development. So on the marketing side, we're thinking about the products that our clients want. We're thinking about our target market. We're thinking about engaging it on an awareness level with our, with our audience. On the business development side, though, we're thinking about how we can go further. And fundamentally, whether it's targets or clients, we're thinking about forging relationships. And it's easy to see on the marketing side that things can be translated online. So webinars, social media, podcasts, all of that was happening before COVID. And what's happened this year is the dial's been turned up on those. But relationships are a lot harder and they're different. Um, and that's really the focus of today. So what I want to do is I want to offer some reflections on the challenges that I've found and um, Client Talk offers consultancy training and coaching to professional services firms. So like everyone online today, um, we're about relationships. And what I want to do is I want to use coffee as a route to thinking about the challenges that I'm finding with business development and why it's more challenging. So the first scenario is let's have coffee. 
So before COVID, if I was popping into London, if I was, you know, popping into Reading, wherever, I would probably have had a think about who it is that I hadn't spoken to for some time. And I would have dropped a line and I said, I'm popping into London. Do you fancy meeting for a coffee? Now, I know that virtual coffees are a thing. I've had virtual coffees with many of the people here online today. But they're a fundamentally different thing because where you're asking someone for a coffee on a Wednesday, they might be there, they might not be there, they might pretend not to be there. But either way, the answer doesn't really matter. If you ask someone for a virtual coffee, what you're effectively doing is you're asking for a meeting and they have to say yes or no. And if they say no, where do you go from that with your relationship? They're also more transactional. So where you would meet for a coffee, you could talk about the weather, you could talk about the tube, you could talk about the pastries. You kind of lose that icebreaker when you do a virtual coffee. The second scenario is conferences. And I've already mentioned, I've, I've spoken at a few conferences this year. And all of the virtual conferences that I've seen either as a speaker or attended have tried to recreate those coffee breaks. And what you end up doing, I find, is that you end up being in a room with, you know, a number of people, the most dominant person takes charge. And you're in this weird scenario where you're kind of watching someone else's conversation. And if it was a real life situation, what I'd probably do is I'd probably go and grab a coffee um, or I'd talk to the person next to me or, you know, I'd be able to engage in a different way. So that's challenging. And I'm also hearing from people that, you know, the conferences are where people would pick up their market intel so it's where that they you know find what's happening in the market they'd be speaking to peers they'd be speaking to you know making new connections so those water cooler moments are being lost not just from offices but also from the events that we tend attend on a networking side the final scenario is coffee at events. And um, I have sent some care packages out to people. I love that people are calling them care packages rather than goodie bags, because I think it really kind of embodies why I've done it. But it's really hard to connect over and above content on a virtual platform. So there are lots of people, I can see lots of names on the participant list and they're people that I haven't seen for ages. And if this was a real event, I would be dashing about like a mad thing, making connections, saying hello, you know, we must meet up. And that's lost online. And also I can't make connections between people. So again, it's really frustrating. I can see down the list of names that it'd be great for, you know, Monica to speak to Guy or whoever, and I can't make those connections. And it's what I enjoy doing with events. And that's lost when you, you translate them to a virtual world. There have been some positives. I wanted to throw some positives in. So LinkedIn for me has been a lifesaver and I've, I've made lots of connections through LinkedIn. Uh, I have had virtual coffees and made new connections and collaborations. I've made relationships through my podcast, but it's required me to think differently and it's required me not to translate online what would otherwise have been offline. And I still really miss coffee. <laughs> um, a final reflection before I turn to the panel. Um, is it me? <laughs> so I do a lot of work with teams and the work that I do with teams involves thinking about the differences that exist in teams and being self-aware. And I've had lots of reflections this year about the work environment and, and about introversion and extroversion. And an extroversion in the young sense is drawing energy from other people. For those of you who have done Myers-Briggs, you will know if you're an E or an I. Uh, for those of you that haven't, um, the best, I think, example is how do you feel after a day of meetings? Do you feel energised and buzzing or do you feel like you need to have a lie down in a quiet room? I'm an extrovert. My best days are the days when I'm talking to people and connecting with people. And I find working from home really difficult. And what's interesting about extroverts is that they communicate differently. So they like to be physically close when they talk. They like to make eye contact. Uh, they like to talk aloud and vocalise their ideas. So I'm wondering whether um, it's me, <laughs> whether my extroversion is something that it means that I'm finding it harder. And one of the things I do when I work with teams is I try and learn from others. So, you know, perhaps if, you know, if, if people online are introverts and actually they're finding it easier, please do make use of this chat button today. Um, you know, perhaps it's something that you're finding easier because actually you're in an environment that works for you. So I want to pick all of that up later. 
Um, but I want to bring my panel in because I want to learn as well today. Um, and the first panelist that we've got is Raya. So Raya, welcome. And can I start by inviting you to share some reflections on what you've been finding with regards to business development this year? Absolutely. Thanks, Claire. And I'm very happy to be here today. Um, what I'll do is I thought I would run through a couple of challenges and then I have tried to put together a list of things that are working well, so focusing on the positive. And I do sort of just need to comment that I do find, I mean, I also am an extrovert, although I, I think hearing you speak, I think there's such a unique combination of being a very empathetic uh, extrovert, which, which you are. So I think we can learn a lot from that approach and I'm looking forward to hearing more about that from you later today. So if we're talking about challenges, I mean, I think you're absolutely right, Claire, to, to point out that there is a huge difference between growing and maintaining existing relationships as well as uh, versus, excuse me, um, developing new ones. That is a huge challenge. Um, in some cases, I think it has really made us focus more on targeting those new relationships. So as opposed to going to um, a, a large conference where it's it's a bit of hit and miss and you might meet several people that you just get on with and it's nice chatting with them but in terms of business development maybe not as focused and that leaves you with a much bigger pool of people to follow up with which I think some people can find quite intimidating so we certainly have to be a lot more targeted in when we're trying to meet new people but sort of finding ways to do that um, can, can absolutely be a challenge and it definitely requires creativity um, and it's sort of not as natural, we really have to sort of get out there and get out of our comfort zones. I think we all understand the sort of webinar, just digital fatigue, just sort of being, um, you know, on our phones in the morning, then on online all day, and then, you know, wanting to shut off at night and perhaps looking at a Kindle or an iPad or watching TV and, and all of a sudden your existence can feel quite screen heavy. So I think just, finding ways to overcome that and still, you know, want people to want to be with you in that environment is, is certainly a challenge. And then I think this isn't necessarily business development per se, but I think it matters because a happy, well-functioning team is key to doing good business development, especially in an organization like mine, which is large. Um, and I think managing the internal team has been a, a huge challenge. Um, we do have a young team and I think understanding that everyone is experiencing our current situation quite differently. So we have some people that have lots of family around and young children and are caring for other people. Well, we have some people that have been on their own for a long time and that is certainly a challenge. But what I find is that the team is really missing each other. They're missing that opportunity to collaborate. They're missing the opportunity to learn from each other by just sort of being alongside each other. And in some cases, um, I think some people work quite well to be creative when they maybe have fewer distractions by not being in the office, but some people really need to feed off of each other in their creative process. So I think trying to find innovative ways to replicate all of that is, is absolutely a challenge and it requires a huge commitment um, to, to keep the team focused and happy and engaged. So those are some of the challenges that we have faced. Um, and I wanted to talk a little bit about a few things that we have found that are working well. So one change that we are working on at the moment, um, many of you may know that the sort of the idea of having sales in a law firm is, is a somewhat new and, and somewhat controversial concept um, because professional services people generally like to think that um, you know, what they have to do is sort of something only they can talk about. And we are seeing in the industry a, a fantastic shift over to including people, whether they are former lawyers or whether they are sales professionals, whether they bring their own network or whether they work with the partners to develop one that's specific to that organization. We're seeing a real shift in that embracing of the sales culture. And I think for, for our firm, the fact that partners can no longer sort of do sales and meet new people incidentally by going about their day-to-day -day business has created a great opening for us. You know, we've been trying to get this going for a while, but now being able to say to the business, you know, we're going to bring in some targeted sales professionals um, and really being able to focus in that way and have the partners, they've been wonderfully receptive to it. So we've just made our first hire um, in the central team in London, which is the team I'm working with. Um, who is going to be a dedicated salesperson. She will also be doing some sort of regular BD and marketing as part of her day job. But I'm really excited to build that with her and see what that looks like over the coming um, months and hopefully years. And I ideally would like to start to build that out in other um, areas of the team if this is successful. So that's been one thing that is exciting to see develop. Um, I think 
our, our digital presence, we've always had a very big presence on online. We do a lot of thought leadership, a lot of videos, we're active on social, but I think the, the difference is rather than thinking about that as marketing content is how do we use that marketing content digitally for business development? So we've been trying to talk to our partners, for example, about it's great that you have a LinkedIn profile, but are you actually entering the conversation on LinkedIn? Are you commenting and tagging people so that you can have a conversation? Are you sending um, content that you think would be re uh, relevant to specific contacts and engaging them in a conversation in that way or if the firm is putting out content it's great to share it um, but if you put a comment on top of it that that will also help your particular contacts who have connected with you and not just the firm and so kind of distinguishing that the personal brand on LinkedIn that is very much tied into our brand as a firm but trying to encourage people to, to think of our digital marketing channels as tools for business development. Um, as part of that, we have been looking at a real data-driven approach to that. So um, really trying to mine our systems. Again, this will, will not be groundbreaking for, for people that are more on the company side, but for law firms, this is a, a, a sea change to be able to actually use data to inform our, our business development plans and to really look at ROI and look at, you know, for, for example, if we're investing a lot in a webinar, which is partner time, BD time, and client time, you know, how many people were on it? How long were they on it for? Did we get instructions afterwards? And, and being able to track that in an, in an easy way is something we've been investing a lot in. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the creative things that my team has been doing to maintain existing relationships and just do some client appreciation. So I think one of the things that's been really interesting to see is that rather than trying to do content all the time, the team has just said, let's do something fun together. This is a difficult situation. It's been weighing on all of us. So we've been working with an organization, for example, in the US um, called the Truffle Shuffle. So these are a few chefs who used to work at the French Laundry, which is a famous California restaurant. They are a certified minority owned business. Um, and they cook with truffles and they do interactive cooking classes. So we bring about 15 clients on, we send them a kit and we make truffle risotto or truffle mac and cheese and a cocktail. And it's got music and it's got the chat function going, but it's it's not really about content. It's about us having that experience and it's um, families, partners, children, pets welcome. So it just, in a virtual way, replicates a little of that sort of warm and fuzzy feeling that you get when you actually go and see a contact and, and have an experience together. Um, and I think the fact that there is a CSR element, so not only um, does the firm make a donation to an organization helping minorities enter the legal profession for each client that we sign up, but equally the, the um, people that put the events together also donate meals to the Black Cultural Zone in Los Angeles. So I think that has also really resonated with our clients. We're extremely active in DNI efforts across the world, particularly the team in the US. I think they've really been leading because we get um, more upfront client demands in that space. And I think it's really nice to see. It's also really authentic. So the team on the ground in the US are incredibly passionate about these issues. So it's not sort of doing this just, just to do it, but this is, you know, they, they sort of live and breathe this stuff. A number of them lead organizations in the Bay Area that are focused on, on women and other diversity and inclusion initiatives. So I think the fact that they've been able to bring that element into their client appreciation events is, is very, very interesting and it's resonated really well. So I think um, that was, those were sort of the main points I wanted to make. And I think the last point is just echoing um, one thing that you said earlier, Claire, which is that we've been trying to encourage people to do more empathetic listening with their clients and just sort of ask people in an open-ended way, how are you? Um, and, and I think there's quite a bit that's tied into our sort of emotional and mental well-being. And it might be something that then leads to a business conversation. So for example, speaking with US in-house counsel about the outcome of the election, but what that meant to them, or you know, what's going on with another round of lockdown and what that means to them, which does usually end up into a conversation about the business and their challenges, which can lead to business development in an authentic way, but it also is helping you build that trusted advisor relationship, which can be easier to maintain in more difficult situations like this. So I think just getting on online and asking people like, how are you, how are things, you know, and, and not just sort of diving into the latest privacy regulation and you need to know that. So, so I think, um, you know, we are continuing to coach everyone in the business that that is a really, really key thing. Um, yeah, so that, that's, uh, I think a, an overview of, of some of the challenges and also some of what has worked well for us.
Thank you, Rhea. Please do use the chat function, everyone, because we will be picking up the comments there. Um, lots of things to pick up there. Truffle mac and cheese sounds amazing. <laughs> um, what I'm hearing there, a couple of things that are interesting is, you know, kind of the importance of the business development function, um, which is really interesting given actually lots of firms are, are, are kind of moving away from the business development function and almost, you know, making cuts in that area, which is really sad. So really encouraging to see that you're kind of, you know, taking the ball by the horns and, and really stepping up. So that's amazing. Um, and, and I think I'm just, you know, on that how are you question, I think that's really powerful. And Smita will talk to you in a second. But I know right at the beginning of lockdown, I reached out to some GCs to find out what they wanted. And overwhelmingly, that how are you question, so simple, but so powerful. And, and, and actually, so many people don't ask it authentically. So, so that's, that's amazing. One last question from you, Ray, before we move over to Monica. And that's, you know, you're obviously doing lots of things this year, perhaps forced by COVID um, and, and the situation that we're in. Is there anything that you're going to stick with, regardless of what happens in the future, the vaccine and, and everything? Yeah, so I think a few things, and one is flexible working. Um, again, law firms do tend to be sometimes a bit slower to change and a bit more conservative. So even though they've been trying for a long time to adopt more flexible working approaches, they've been forced to, and I don't really see that changing. So I think that is a, a good shift. Um, we are also seeing the uh, development of roles, they're, they're changing. So for example, some of the administrative roles that we had in the firm where they might've been focused on things like booking partners travel and um, sort of doing things like that. We, we are now giving um, administrators the opportunity to look at the business needs and sort of apply for jobs within some of the other part, departments such as mine and being able to have some administrative support then frees up my team to focus on more sort of high value business development and strategic and strategy driven uh, projects. So I think that's a really good shift and it's very, very encouraging to see the firm taking that approach as opposed to cutting resources. Um, I think that we have had a really good opportunity. We're an international firm. We have 30 offices in 20 something countries. And I think being able to always think about who else we could include in our client meetings or in our presentations, um, that's been fantastic. And I, I think being able to have that because we're virtual and people as time zone permitting can, can join things. I think we will very much stick with that. Um, and I think the last piece is really, it, it ties in a little bit with sustainability and the fact that we have had this pause of the frenetic schedule of, you know, flying off to New York to see a client and then flying to a conference in, in Brussels and, and maybe having those trips be sort of one person just going. And, and I really just don't see that happening anymore. I think what we're going to see is that people will have trips, they'll travel, but they'll sort of go and try to do lots of things. So they'll go and they'll try to see a lot of clients and go to a conference, you know, and maybe meet up with, do some networking. But I think there will be a push to sort of look at multidisciplinary teams, you know, where can they do that to have the biggest impact? And I think there'll be a focus on sustainability. You know, is this trip, can it, can it be done virtually? And if it can be done virtually, we really need to think about that and balance that with um, airplane travel and, and other travel. So I, I think that um, that will stay. And, and I think those are good things. I, I look forward to sort of seeing how all of that develops. Thank you. Monica, I'm going to um, bring you in. I can see people using the chat. Please do that. I know I've not picked up on any of those yet, but we will have time at the end for, for going through all the chats. So do whilst you think of something, if you're anything like me, it then pops out of my head. So please keep using the chat. Monica, um, lovely to see you today. Um, the first question is just if there's anything that's resonated with anything that, that Ray has been talking about or that, that I kind of touched on in my introduction. There are quite a few things actually that uh, that apply to even a firm such as ours. I mean, one of the things I wanted to point out first of all is the difference between what Rhea was talking about and ours, given the fact that our company is really quite small. So we're a small team of 12 um, like team members of which nine are deal makers. So we're actually quite top heavy. And what's tended to happen is that, you know, we historically not had enough time to do business development. The nature of our business, because we're working with clients to help them to, like I said, raise capital or um, exit, is that we spend a lot of time working with them. So we're spending a lot of time with their teams, usually in their offices, getting to know the business, because obviously the better we understand the business, the better we can communicate, you know, why it's such a value proposition for an investor or for an acquirer. And so, you know, COVID has really impacted the way that we work. And initially we were quite concerned. 
um, as you would expect, or, or maybe not, I guess I can explain to people, um, because of COVID, a lot of the um, investors that are typically going in to do a capital raise, really, there was a lot of talk about how, you know, valuations were going to be depressed um, in the market. And so if you were an entrepreneur thinking about going to raise capital, your instinct probably was to hold back, right? So you would go to your existing shareholders see if you can get a bridge round of investment from them and then wait it out until 2021, where you would then go to market and do a proper raise. That's kind of what we, we saw that happening. Um, and and the, the result of that is our pipeline, our kind of organic, natural pipeline really dried out. So earlier on in the COVID period, we were quite concerned about what was going to happen to our business model and how you know our clients typically come to us and how we had to think about new ways to reach out and approach potential clients. And so when we started out talking about, you know, business development and what we had to do and how we could approach new clients, it was a, a, a it was a learning, you know, opportunity for us. And that's putting it nicely, if you know what I mean. You know, people who are used to kind of speaking to people that walk in through the door and kind of delivering a service to say, now we need to go out there and see if we can find clients. It was just a whole different dynamic for our team. And so we had to learn, right? We had to learn a few things. Um, some of the things that we did in our team is, um, you know, we, we started holding like webinars which you know we, we've never really done before at least we thought about doing talked about doing planned to do but never actually did but because this was now our primary channel for communicating with prospective clients which is basically people we wouldn't necessarily have have known about us or have come naturally to us we had to kind of action that and so we did that with it with a couple of law firms uh, with different law firms we actually went out did some webinars to try and attract um, attention to icon and what it is that we provide it was also a good opportunity for for us to stay in touch with our existing relationships with, with investors. We've got investors that we work with. Um, typically when a co company comes to us, depending on what kind of a company it is, right? If it's a FinTech or a health tech or a cybersecurity kind of firm, we know that there are certain investors that like those kinds of businesses, but this was an opportunity for us to stay connected to everyone, even if we weren't necessarily working on an engagement in that space. So that was a good opportunity for us to do that as well. Um, LinkedIn, your point on LinkedIn, I can't put enough exclamation marks on that. It's good gone from being this tool that I would kind of scroll through once a week on a Friday afternoon to something that I look at every day, multiple times a day, just to see what's going on, what, you know, who, who's done a raise, uh, you know, what kind of investors are, are looking at certain types of companies, what our competitors are doing, uh, companies in certain spaces that we are interested in, just what's going on. So LinkedIn has been a lifesaver. Honestly, I spend more time on LinkedIn than I ever thought was possible. Mm -hmm. um, and I can say it's the same for our team. We all feel that way. Um, so so from, from the kind of new business side of things, COVID has really focused the attention of our team. We've gone from, you know, it's this thing we have to do, don't really want to do it, to we have to do it, and we are doing it, and it's actually working out quite well for us successfully. So, as I said, we've gone from, you know, that March-April period where we were nervous about what our pipeline would look like, to everybody's really busy, there's a lot of work going on, and, you know, honestly, we, we can't do another webinar till next year because we're really busy. So, it's, it's, it's been a success, I'll put that, so that's the new business. Um, in terms of existing relationships, that's that's been a bit more interesting, to be honest. I mean, with the investors that we work with, a lot of it is really quite transactional. You know, we reach out to them when we have an opportunity we think might be of interest. They reach out to us when they're looking for something in a certain sector and think we might be able to deliver that for them. So there's always been that bit of a transactional relationship. But, you know, it was possible that I could be in a certain area in London and, you know, I'm in Victoria. I know a couple of people who are near Victoria Station. I'll pop in and have a 10 minute, 15 minute, 30 minute chat, just to pop in, nothing serious, to just kind of keep that relationship going. We don't have that anymore. And so what you were talking about earlier of saying, you know, let's have a virtual coffee. If I set up a virtual coffee with an investor, chances are they're expecting me to actually have something for them. They're not expecting me to just kind of chat for 30 minutes or chat for 20 minutes. You know, it, it would feel, I, I, it's somehow coming across as though I'm wasting someone's time. Whereas before that was quite natural. If I was in the area, I, I, I would say, I'm in the area, how about a coffee? I'm in the area, let's just catch up. Now I feel I can only reach out to an existing investor if I actually have something for them. So in that sense, I feel we're losing out. It's not, it's not, it hasn't been beneficial. Um, with, with, uh, with clients, well, that's a little bit more interesting as well. So our, um, just so you know, our fee structure is we have a retainer, but the majority of our fee is success-based. 
And so we spend a lot of time looking at uh, potential clients as what are the chances or what's the likelihood of us actually being able to close around with these guys? Are we likely to do the raise? Are we likely to, to sell the business? And a lot of that is just how, you know, how the client comes across in a room, you know? What we see when we speak to them is what the investor or the acquirer will see when we're with them. So we make a lot of decisions based on this looks like a really capable team, the way they communicate, the way they sit up, the way they, you know, just all the, the kind of non-verbals, if you know what I mean. All of that comes across when you're speaking to clients, right? And so um, it's really difficult now because it's all on screen. So our ability to really judge whether this is the kind of person that investors are going to like because they're going to see what we're going to see. That, that makes it really difficult for everyone. You know, it's, it's difficult for us to make that decision to proceed. And I think it's also difficult for investors to be able to do, you know, one, um, one of the things we talk about quite a bit is the new normal when it comes to investing and how investors, similar to us, right? We have to take a bet, a risk that we'll be able to conclude with this client. We'll be able to close the raise or, or sell, the business, sell the business. Investors are the same. They have to make decisions about, you know, is this, is this client that I'm speaking to, is this the person who's gonna be able to give me that return? If I put in X amount of money, will I be able to get X plus, you know, whatever X plus Y at the end of three years? And it's all based on these Zoom calls and looking at data rooms, which, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a new norm. So I'm finding that quite fascinating. Um, Another thing that we do is international businesses. So, you know, as I said, with Icon, up to 75% of the business that we have is international in some way. And, and so we, I used to have to get on a plane and meet someone if it's a prospective client, right? So go to um, Kenya, go to Belgium, go to Ireland, go to Bulgaria, wherever my client might be. I can't do that anymore. So there's a lot of faith and trust in what we're, you know, what we're calling the new norm which we just didn't have before. I have to have faith and trust that there is that office and there are that many people and they're all working as they should. I mean, I, I, I can't check it. I can't go and meet the team. I can't do any of that. I just have to trust. So, um, you know, that inability to travel internationally is making things quite interesting um, for our business. Um, so that's, that's kind of covering the, the existing clients and the new clients dynamic, you know, from the business development side. And then personally, just to end off on the personal side of things, um, I'm, I, can, I consider myself, well, I did one of these tests. So I am, I'm an introvert. I'm an introvert who likes people, which is to say I really enjoy talking to people. But when I get off the call, I have like, oh, I'm exhausted, right? That's, 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 that's how I work. And so I'm loving working from home. I've never been more efficient. I don't have someone just coming and standing at my desk and chatting, which I used to find really disruptive. I mean, I'm loving this working from home. But at the same time, all the Zoom calls are really draining for me because the Zoom is just really in your face. We're looking at each other, whether it's one, two or three people, everyone can see your facial expression. It's so um, zoned in. If I was in a, in, a, in a meeting room, I would look to my you know, pad, I'd grab a coffee, you know, it, it, there would just be all sorts of things going on. I could be looking at my computer. Now it's dead on for 30 minutes or for an hour. And I find that really draining. And so top tip, I found out that I can switch off my video. <laughs> so this is a top tip. So I used to take off my video and I still have the calls. And so I'm, I've been able to manage my energy that way because I really was finding it really draining. Um, and, you know, it's, it's really helped in terms of just, you know, treating it like a call rather than treating it like a video call, which I know is really frustrating for some people who really prefer videos. But for me, as, a, as I said, a, an introvert who likes people, I've been finding that to be quite a lifesaver. Thanks, Monica. So many things there and and we will have chance for, for questions and things at the end. Trust coming through and a really interesting reflection there around, you know, not being able to fact check whether people have the, you know, the offices and the, the backdrop that they say they do. And I'm going to I'm going to take that point and I'm going to bring it across to Guy now, because Guy, I know that you invest in companies. I know you've got many different hats, but one of the hats that you do have is that you invest in in companies and and, you know, It'd just be interesting to hear your reflections on how you found the new normal and, and what impact that's having. Uh, in terms of investing or generally? Yeah, in terms of, well, both, but investing initially and then we'll go on to the general. Um, well, it's, uh, I think it's the, the impact of the changed working patterns is quite different in different situations, actually. So, um, I find with um, 
I tend to invest in really small businesses, tiny startup businesses where there's a hope and a dream and, you know, uh, somebody is trying to change the world and, um, and you, you put a lot of faith in the person because that's what I like. That's what I think I'm good at. Certainly the things that have worked for me, it's because I've done that well. And the things that haven't worked, actually, I haven't done it very well. So, um, uh, and I haven't been drawn to people, actually, new people from in that way. I think I do find that quite difficult, that level of, of um, uh, connection with somebody and the trust. Um, I think it's quite hard to do uh, over a video call. So that, that I guess, hasn't really worked for me. I suppose rather than me trying lots and lots of times, I've just withdrawn from it. So, um, uh, so maybe if I tried harder, <laughs> Uh, you know, I would, but you don't wake up in the morning wanting to spend money on things. I don't think, well, I must spend X thousand pounds today on a company. It doesn't really work that way. So it's very easy, that kind of thing, just to say, I won't do it. I'm not a professional full-time investor. I do it for fun and I want to make money as well, but, um, you know, so it's easy for me to turn off. So I'm, I'm, I'm probably not like somebody who's got a venture fund and a clock ticking and I must get this money invested. They're probably much more, active engaged with it they force them th themselves through the pain barrier i'm sort of like ah, i can't be bothered um so i'm probably not that instructive um what, what i would say in general though just one just general point about these different forms of communication i'm going to have a go at monica here turning off her turning off her video um i i i see the the different ways of communicating in a spectrum and um a telephone call being the least effective and uh, a meeting being the most effective um in in terms of in in that moment when you're in the meeting and i think it's because of how long you can be on the phone i cannot be on a phone for more than well not more than half an hour my ear starts hurting that's why i wear this um aircraft control thing my ears i'm also in an office with people around me so you might hear the coffee machine go and things like that but my ear starts hurting um i find it hard to stay engaged with what somebody's saying i get bored really quickly why don't you speed up why are you going on about this? I, I don't enjoy telephone calls, I, but I don't enjoy them full stop. You know, I don't have a long call with my mum, you know, to her frustration. I just don't like them. I, mean, I think it might be, without being too sexist about it, it might be a male thing. I just don't like long telephone calls. I like short functional telephone calls, but I can talk to somebody in a room for hours and hours and hours. It's totally different. And what I find with video calls is they're in the middle. And you can extend them much closer to a normal conversation by making it fun and being more relaxed about it. And I think the more intense people are, you know, then actually it's a massive turnoff. So when I have calls with people, I really try and make it fun. In a way, I'm trying to make this fun, you know, as hard <laughs> as that is with that 51 people watching. But I really try to because I think it's way, actually, you might feel like you're being less impressive or you're not ticking the boxes and you're not being super articulate. But I think that people engage with it much better. So for me, I've found video calls really, really good for business to business sales. So what my process has been is I start off calling them up and I, I call up with a killer offer, which is engaging and they'll want to have the call. And then I make the call fun and they like me, hopefully, and they think that I'm the kind of person they might do business with. And, uh, you know, I can sort of try and I try and get them to be relaxed. And it's worked really, really well for me. In fact, I'm never going to go back to traveling around the country. I'm never doing it ever again. So, you know, getting a car with like 15,000 miles on it, no way, 5,000 miles, that'll be enough for my lease car. It's not happening. So that's, so that, that's what I really want. Um, in the other side of our business though, where we, I mean, so me as, a bit, um, as an entrepreneur, I'm recruiting other businesses to help me, but underneath it all, um, we have consumers, you know, new, new people who are gonna buy advice or buy investment products. Actually during um, lockdown, when face-to-face -face meetings stopped, that, that became very difficult. Um, so uh, I do think it's case specific about what works and what doesn't work. And I think the reason it became very difficult is if you're going to make a, um, Again, it's partly, sorry, I'm not being super articulate here, but hopefully I'm being nice and people are still listening. But it's partly a bit about um, whether you wake up in the morning and you have to do something. So if you're in a business, you know, I'm, uh, I, I'm in business, I'm, I must do things, you know, I need to get a move on. I'm not, it's, you know, I enjoy it, but it's not for pleasure primarily. It's, a, it's got other purposes. So you've got this, you, this um, uh, push all the time. When it's something for you personally, the status quo is very powerful, isn't it? well, so I'm going to invest my money, but I'm not invested today. So if I'm not invested tomorrow, nothing changes that much. 
you know, it's not like buying insurance where someone says you must buy car insurance today. So I think in those kind of things, it's much easier to put it off. Um, and the other thing about money is trust is hugely important. So I can try and be really nice on the phone or on the video call and try and make people engaged. But there's nothing like feeling someone's presence in front of you. How do they move? How are they? You know, where, what were they like with the receptionist? Um, you know, how's their chat? Just do they seem like nice people? And, you know, I'm sure all of us get that impression when you meet people that you just think they're a bit snaky or slimy and there's something not quite right about them. And that's easier to find out in face to face. So I think I think that's quite important. So I, but I, I'd, I'd say generally, I mean, just as lockdown for me uh, has been an incredibly positive experience. I mean, I haven't enjoyed it personally because I'm extroverted and I like meeting up with people and stuff like that but um, it's been a very very positive thing because of the new ways of working that have been forced on us and uh, I mean I can't wait to reduce the size of my office in nine months time because only about a quarter of the people who are in my company want to work in the office so <laughs> I'm going to save a fortune doing that uh, so that, that that's all been really good it's also been very interesting about how different types of communication have worked and others haven't and uh, yeah, I mean, I think these kind of forced experiments are quite useful. I've got a whole list of things I think are going to change in the world, but I won't bore you anyway, because it's not, it's not specific to this. <laughs> but, I'm, you know, I think it's obvious about certain things are going to change medium term that are even not, not work related. I, I think it's going to have very long lasting effects on lots of things. And one of the effects is going to be I'm not driving around the country in my car <laughs> selling to people anymore. <laughs> Just not doing it. Some really interesting themes there and I think themes that are coming through so trust and about you know this thing about how it's harder to trust someone if you haven't actually met them and I think you know I'm seeing that too you can you can go so far online but there is that kind of desire still I think to to see people and um you know I can see some of the chats and some of the comments that are coming up but you know the non-verbal really important you don't get the sense of all of that online you know it is a bit you know are you wearing pajama bottoms underneath the desk and are your legs madly going you can't you know there's lots of things you can't see um wet, you know online really interesting um i'm going to ask uh, one more question of guy before i go to smita and and as i said at the beginning what i like to try and do when i do my events is get different perspectives so rather than have a room of business development people talking about how difficult it is to talk to clients i like to have the client perspective too and, and Guy, you're, you're wearing lots of different hats here, but you know, you work with lots of different advisors. Lots of different advisors are probably thinking, gosh, I'd love to have a conversation with Guy. We've done this focused approach that Rare has been talking about. You've been identified as, as someone that people want to reach out to. What would you value in the current climate in terms of people trying to reach out to you? Okay, I, I'm, I, I'm going to give you, I've got a killer point klaxon here, right? Because <laughs> I've thought about this quite a lot and I had a breakthrough recently in my own business uh, with this, that um, a lot of people get straight down to business when they're talking about stuff. Like I have a product and I'm really trying to not show it, but I just really want to sell you that product. And I'm going to talk to you about this product, about how amazing it is. And actually very often what you really need is somebody who's going to help you decide whether you really need to buy anything at all. And I think a brilliant, my great point, Claxon, is if you start a meeting, and I've done this with some of our advisors, the feedback's been amazing. So in financial advice, what I've said to people is, ask them right at the start, right at the very beginning of the meeting, whether, uh, this, is the, this is specific in our industry, but different words in different industries, whether they already know that they want to take financial advice and they're just trying to find the right advisor, whether actually what they want from this meeting firstly is to find out whether or not they benefit from advice and the effect of those words uh, is um, uh, very dramatic on the meeting and I think the reason is because it takes you from being on the other side of the table to sitting next to them reading a magazine together having a chat about what the right thing is to do reading a magazine together is not quite right analogy, but you know <laughs> what I mean as in very friendly we're on my side right let's have a chat about it let's mm. have a chat about uh, legal services mm. right and actually the do's and don'ts and how you how you think about value and um uh so I, I would say that is I, I I would recommend people do that at the start and just in terms of professional services nothing to do with this whatsoever but I I um as the drummed into my, my upbringing, I don't wake up in the morning wanting to spend money, but I 100% have changed my view about professional services, about being something where I get good enough at a low cost 
to actually I need to think carefully about really what quality level I need. It, it is the definition of something that is not a commodity. Legal services, um, someone helping you sell your business is so far away from that. So that um, uh, I, I myself, no, but nobody taught me to do that, though, unfortunately. So someone should have sat down and helped me understand it really early, that value is a really key concept in these services and understanding it and being more um, uh, helping people be more anal analytical, about, analytical about it. But um, that's my perception of it over time, that my own observation, uh, probably from, from some bad experiences, is cheap legal services are not value i do not believe it and cheap services generally i think it's the, i think it's the wrong way of looking at it um but what would be really helped me is somebody to sit down and help me understand what value is so just back to the thing i said at the start and this i can i can promise you the psychological effects of doing that are dramatic to start the conversation with that anyway so that's my klaxon i'll put my klaxon down Thanks, Guy. And I think that's really interesting. I think sometimes, you know, working on the professional services side, you know, there's kind of a fear of reaching out to people because, you know, you don't, you know, I think some professionals do realise the value that they're bringing, but but actually understanding that it's a relationship, that it's two way, that there is value. And, um, you know, I think. Can I say one other thing, Claire? Yeah. Just give you one more yeah. one more thing that I'm doing that I found is that um, so in uh, I'm trying to build a fund management business here with Exter. So I've got an advisory business and a fund management business and I'm, the fund management business is for my own clients. But really, predominantly, it's for other people's because that's how you build a good business, how you get scale and getting someone to trust you as a fund manager takes quite a long time because and actually what I think my observation of are similar things to sellers so you can have a great meeting and someone's like yeah guy I love it you sound amazing and then actually they don't do anything and the reason they don't do anything is because they're going to watch you for a period of time because inst even if they haven't verbalized it mentally instinctively if you like something you then want to test it by sitting back knowing you like it and then seeing in six months time if you still like it because it's a great internal test you're aware in the back of your mind that you might want to use guys investment services but then actually in six months time having carried that thought around with you and looked at linkedin and met other people if you still think that that thing is the best it's a really good test now the way that you keep those people engaged is you've got to have a calendar of interesting things to say to them because you can't call them up having a coffee every month and you can't call them up with something so you have to have something which gives them a kind of ah i didn't know that moment every single month and that's what i'm trying to create with the context that i've got around fund management is every single month right i'm going to talk about gold now hey bitcoin that's really interesting it's probably the best investment out there right now. So it's a dip, dip from me. But um, uh, I try and write something really interesting and I try and get it in a way which gives somebody an, ah, that's, I didn't know that moment. Okay, then I'll, I'll shut up now. But there's a, I, I would really give that, I really think that's a way of nurturing contacts to yeah. make sure you, you organize it and you have something to say to them every single month, which makes them stop and think, oh, you know, because it builds your value in them. Amazing. Thank you. I feel like we should have the thing along the bottom. Investments can go up as well as down if anyone wants to buy Bitcoins. <laughs> Especially Bitcoin. <laughs> don't, don't come back to us if they go down. Uh, thank you ever so much. I'm going to bring Smita in now. So we've got, um, for those of you online, um, we have got lots of time for questions. So um, uh, we've kind of scheduled this into about quarter past. So the plan is to go um, for about 10 minutes with, with Smita and then we're going to bring over my microphone on the floor uh, we're going to um bring everyone in for questions so um so perfect so smita i'm going to start off with the same question that that i've asked others which is any reflections on what you've heard so far this morning yeah no absolutely a lot i think there's a lot that's resonated with me across from what raya through to monica and guy have been saying um there's been challenges in terms of as you said as well claire in terms of you know growing and maintaining existing relationships one thing that I have found, which is totally out of character for me, because I am an introvert, but I love being around people like Monica. I need to be around people, um, is actually forging new relationships. And I've done that so much more this year than I probably have ever done you know, in the last few years. And I think it's because when we have calls that are over Zoom, um, for me, you know, I. I I get bored with just telephone calls. It just, it needs to have some context to it. It needs to have an end goal to it. But when you're on Zoom and you're watching somebody and they're watching you, there needs to be a real kind of outcome of it rather than it just being a chat. And there's an expectation, I think on both sides that that should be the case as well. 
Um, and so to have that, as Guy mentioned, that aha moment, what is it that you can actually deliver? You know, what is it that's, that's something different for them to think about? That's become a lot more prevalent um, in this current climate because people are expecting something out of it or maybe well be that you are as well, as opposed to just to having a general conversation about something. Because they'll think, well, I've just spent time, it's been really exhausting, not really achieved anything. What was the point of that? I'm not gonna be speaking to that person again. And especially in this current climate, I think it's so important in terms of connecting with so many people, but it's not just what they can give to you. It's sort of what you can give back to them. And I think that's something that's not tested me, but it's been really exciting for me over the past number of months um, in terms of the different types of relationships I've forged, the connections that I've made in terms of seeing how successful someone may well become through those relationships that I've connected them to as well. And it's not necessarily expecting anything back. Um, it's actually just connecting the, the dots. And for me, it's, it's paying it forward, which I think is really key. Um, as I found that not just through work, but through so many different mediums that even generally when we are able to go out, people seem to be a lot kinder, I think. Um, than they have been. And I don't know whether that's because the area that I'm in or the work that I'm doing or the people that I've engaged with, but I haven't seen that before. Um, and I think it's people kind of realizing the importance of the time that they have with each other and what is it that they can do to help each other as well. What I do miss is sort of those moments when I'm in the office and people are constantly disturbing me because I want to be able to be there and help them. And it's not having that chance to be able to speak to everybody all the time. Um, I'm kind of okay working from home or being in the office, but you know, I, I did enjoy the time when I was in the office because I could go and walk across to someone to say, look, you know, I've got this issue. Can we just have a chat with these guys just to try and blitz this, this problem? And it's not so easy to do that now because everybody's schedules are so tight and you may just not necessarily get that time with each other anyway. Um, so that's one of the challenges. And in terms of overcoming it, it's more of like having those online chats with people um, and not necessarily, I mean, I've found that some people don't necessarily tend to engage on those chats as frequently as perhaps you might just go across and have a chat with them when you're in the office as such. So I think it's finding a medium in which to be able to do that, to continue to support the business moving forward um, and not necessarily just having everybody on Zoom because you know, as some of us have mentioned, it is really draining. Every little kind of you know, movement that you make or not, um, while you're not on video or, or whatever, it, it's, so, it's so criticized in some way. And it, it's at the end of the day, it's kind of, I, I feel exhausted because of it, but equally it's, it's sort of fulfilling because, you know, I've managed to sort of sort out a number of issues and along the way outside of work is also being able to help a number of people as well. So I've been on lots of team calls, lots of conferences, um, and it's always, it's very much cramped. I mean, before we used to do kind of a whole day conference and, and annual conferences um, with lawyers, we, we should have about, I don't know, 200 odd or something. But now it's sort of, you know, squashed into a, an, an hour or so. And it's really difficult just to try and pass that message across in terms of what, you, what you're, you know, what, you, what the seminar is about or the points that you want to make or other issues that people want to discuss or have that networking that you have on breakout sessions, et cetera. Um, I think that's a space to watch in terms of how that area can be developed and, and fostered further. But yeah, it's it's been it's been a, a strange year for me because I've never found, you know, to be the one to actually be going out and making all these relationships. Um, whereas previously it's kind of head down, just trying to get the work done um, as much as possible. Thank you. I'm going to pick up on something that um well, something that I, a reflection that I've had and, and, and something that I've mentioned at the beginning, 
I, mean, I think what's really interesting um, this morning is is just everyone's different take. I mean, there are some themes that are running through, but but for me, it's that message of you know not everyone likes telephone calls, not everyone responds to Zoom in the same way, and and I and, you know I, drawing back on what I said at the beginning, Smita, it really kind of stayed with me right at the beginning um, of lockdown when we spoke, and you said you know I haven't had those calls that I was expecting to say how are you and how are you getting on and 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 the, and the power in that so um I, that's just sort of resonating with me now and i guess the question i've got for you again similar to the one that i asked for guy you know as a gc you know when ray is doing her lists and and you know putting down names you're the sort of person that would be on one of those lists what would you respond to? What would you like in terms of, you know, someone at Raya's firm or, you know, that would be looking to reach out to a GC? What would you respond to? Um, I think it's it's important for, for someone to really know the market well in terms of the industry that I work in um, and, you know, understand what the challenges have been because it has to be really relevant in terms of the industry that we work in as opposed to just kind of saying, oh, you know, there's issues around, I don't know, business uh, revenue share or whatever. It has to be really relevant. And I guess a couple of examples, especially within the FinTech and payments industry is in terms, say for instance, digital wallets or issues in terms of outages or where is it that um, a firm can add value to what it is that, that we're doing as opposed to being very generic. Um, and I think that is, a lot more focused now than before that it needs to be it, it needs to be kind of relevant not just to the legal team but to the business as well because as lawyers we there's so many um entrepreneurial businesses out there who can provide legal tech services but how does that help in terms of the industry that we're actually in thank you going back to guy's point there of knowing your value and knowing how you're adding value and actually, uh, 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 someone yesterday I was talking to when I was talking to them about value add, you know, said it's only it's only value if it's relevant. Um, and I think that's that's resonating. I'm going to bring other people in now. I know that there has been some some activity in the chat. So I'm going to bring Millie in because she's been monitoring that for me. Mo Millie, are there any reflections from the chat? And then what we'll do is we'll bring um, other people in to ask questions. For questions, feel free to either um, put it in the chat and Millie will pick it up. Or uh, if you want to take yourself off uh, mute and turn your cameras on, you can do that and you can just ask, ask the question. But if we start off with Millie, you can just give um, an overview of what's been happening in the chat um, in the background. Yes, hi everyone. Um, obviously lots of positive thank yous and, and comments after each of our individual speakers. So um, I hope that all the speakers get a chance to look at the chat because um, immediately after you spoke, there was a lot of, a lot of positivity. A lot of the, the um, discussions have come back to the introvert and extrovert kind of angle. And I want to just add one thing personally with that. Um, you know, I, I'm being an events manager, I love being with people and, you know, I love being front and centre and, and everything like that. But what I'm finding really interesting, and I don't know if anyone else is, but with COVID, I think you're getting less of um, a multi-generational interaction. Uh, I mean, I've got two primary school aged children and I love going to pick them up every day and hearing the buzz of kids and stuff. And I also am a leader at Rainbows, which is like brownies. But I love having 18 children in the room and they're all buzzing off each other because you know what kids make us remember that we all get so busy and so stressed and so caught up in this in the business day to day but you know what kids live in the moment and I think that's it's really been interesting to watch my own girls how they're coping with the situation but also just that whole remembering that you know we can get so caught up in business and of course it's important um but kids just take that moment and they and they really put everything into it and um I think that that's different online you know um and so and, and again flip side is you know I see my parents but I haven't seen any of their friends or I've seen our neighbors next door and we've been playing bingo across the fence and things but you know having that older generation as well you know giving us those tidbits of insight and stuff like that um, that you're not necessarily going to get them on Zoom, but still they've just got that amazing, 
you know, those little gems of advice and they're like, oh, in my day, you know, we've all heard it. Um, but, it, you know, I feel like I'm getting that less and I don't know what, what people are thinking. But coming back to why you originally came to me, Claire, is, um, you know, a lot of the chat has been, um, you know, people saying thank you to, to our speakers. But it is just that kind of how do we, how do we take everyone's personalities absolutely embrace that and and you know make them shine in their own way you know like all of us in a great you know any role that you work with people is making that person be the best person they can be and and how can we accept those differences and we're in previously in meetings we'd bring in different teams and different personalities because we know that a diverse team works best how do we still do that online and and make sure that the introverts who might be sitting at home working super hard but not so vocal how do we still bring them into those conversations so um that's where i'd probably start picking up the conversation yeah thanks um is there anyone online that has a question for any of our panelists and if we if we do that first as i said if you feel free to either chat or take yourselves off camera and mute Otherwise, if any of our panelists have questions for any of the other panelists, it's your opportunity to ask now as well. Silence if you wait for someone. Someone must have a question. Well, I, I, I would just pick up on Monica's <laughs> point, actually, which is a similar thing. You know, she was saying about the difficulty of just having a coffee, you know, and I sort of picked on that, on that already. But I think that is... Um, if I was taking one thing from today that I think people might be able to take into what they do and benefit from, it's thinking about that challenge and thinking about how do they make it valuable and interesting and fun for someone to spend 15 minutes with them, 20 minutes with them once a month or to read their email. And um, But I wouldn't forget the fun bit because I think if you associate yourself, people just, you know, if you just think about who do you like talking to, you don't like, if you have a bad experience with somebody, which would include them wasting your time, you will avoid talking to that person, won't you? You just won't answer their email or you'll be busy or, um, yeah. So I, I just think coming up with a strategy for that so that you can you can keep the, um, we, the plates turning or the wheels spinning or whatever the expression is, but you can, you can be present whilst people are working out whether they really want to use you. Has anyone on online got any good examples of how they've cracked that, you know, let's just have a quick coffee moment? Claire, um, um, as Lara, um, I'm doing loads of virtual coffees um, and actually as an extra, I'm quite liking being online. I do miss the face-to-face -face networking, but I'm still getting quite a lot out of doing virtual meetings. And it's interesting the point Guy makes. Personally, I always look at how I can help other people. So obviously the reality is we all want to get something out of having coffees with people, but I don't go into it with that mindset. It's more, how can I help them? Um, so I've even ended up getting recommendations off the back of my coffees with people, um, just by introducing them to other people. Because like, I think like you said, Claire, and, and some other people said on the call, if we were physically at an exhibition or at a conference, we would hook people up with each other. So you can 100% do that just online. Um, and one of the other things I've started doing, and it was great to um, hear that people are using LinkedIn more because I'm a massive advocate of LinkedIn um, and I've written down some notes. So I'll be mentioning you in my LinkedIn posts. Um, mm -hmm. I think it was um, Raya, that, um, not Raya, sorry, Monica said about using LinkedIn so much more. Um, but with my LinkedIn now, whenever I get a new connection request, I'm suggesting we have a virtual coffee so that I can, because I've got a bit more time. I'm not going out and spending an hour driving somewhere to have a coffee with someone. So having 10, 15 minutes, coffee with someone just get to know them a little bit better online um is really proving beneficial and it's that whole you don't know who other people know um so i would just say that yeah it's it's different but it's not necessarily worse um and i think your little i put it on my desk i didn't eat it all in advance i have been <laughs> but um you know your little way of um providing that shared experience so by sending something out so we had Quite a bit of success in the first lockdown of sending cakes to people that we wanted to have coffees with um, and then there was that shared thing to talk about um, and also you can still talk about I mean obviously you can't talk about the tube you're not getting the tube but Claire you mentioned you you know you don't feel like you talk about the weather but actually you can still talk about all that stuff 
it's I tend to use the term channeling your inner hairdresser um, because that's how you get to to know people and you know Millie's mentioned that she's got kids so that's something we instantly know about Millie and just understanding what other people are going through in their lives starts to build up that whole no trust and like with people so it's been really interesting because obviously all of your speakers have got very different backgrounds um, so hearing their take on it has been really useful for me so thank you Claire for putting it on. No problem. Thank you. And I think LinkedIn, I'm going to pick up on LinkedIn, because as I said, I, I love LinkedIn over over lockdown. And I think, you know, a, a lots of the speakers today have been talking about authenticity and have been talking about trust. And actually, that's one of the things that I've really liked this year is that, you know, I mean, partly it's because I now have my own company. So I can I can say what I like. And if it if it goes wrong, I'm it's, a, you know, it's my company now. Um, but, um, you know, but actually reaching out to people on LinkedIn and seeing it as I, you know, I almost see it as a virtual conference space where if I see someone who's interesting, I, you know, I can reach out and say hi and much like in a conference, they can say hi back or, you know, they might make an excuse and go to the loo or whatever, but, but actually reaching out to people that way and, and having virtual coffees, you know, does work. Um, but I think, you know, the message that I'm getting from everyone online is, you know, it, there needs to be some thought behind that. And, and yes, you can have the, you know, the, the chat but you know what's the value that you're bringing to that conversation or or you know particularly if you're the one reaching out what you know what can you offer in that space are there any other thoughts or reflections i'm going to bring I, I don't normally pick on people in the audience and i have had one person already message me beforehand he knows that i pick on people to say don't pick on me but steve steve if if you're online gone from you know not knowing anything about people to watching them sit in their kitchens yeah. um you know or knowing oh they have to go because you know they have to go pick up their kids whatever it is it's just made us all a little bit more human you know it, that's the one thing i have to say i've really enjoyed about this process is you know we've kind of stripped the suits and and you know this is what i look like my you know my my work persona we're yes. all a little bit more human and i i actually really like that i really appreciate it and it yeah. makes it just makes things easier i mean that's the definitely the upside uh, yeah. about the process definitely and I think it kind of going on from that, I don't know about you all, but I used to have like a work uniform and a home uniform, you know, and when I was going into the city, you know, I'd put on different clothes or I'd put my high heels on or things like that, you know, and it kind of helped with your armor. Um, and, you know, I, I don't know, are people still doing that? You know, like even sometimes when they're doing these um, piece to cameras on the news and stuff sometimes there's people sitting there on a Sunday morning, their full suit and tie and everything. And I know it's BBC. But um, I don't know, is that still appropriate? I kind of think, you know what, you're in your, you're in your lounge at eight o'clock or 7 a.m. on a Saturday morning. Go on, just put a collared shirt on. You know, you don't have to do the tie, but it's really interesting how those people still see that as their work uniform or um, and things like that. It's, it's fascinating to see that, as you say, Monica, just that self-care, that real interest in people more is is shining through but i'm going to pass the microphone back to claire she's rejoined <laughs> <us. laughs> well, i had really as backup the one thing that you can't do on a, on a, in a real the difference between virtual and real coffee is that the wi-fi doesn't fail in real coffee but anyway um i really interesting comments there that i was picking up with at the end um i'm conscious of time because it's quarter past which was the was the closing time if people are still online and have still got questions feel free to, to ask those um, but, um, but otherwise, for those of you that do need to run, thank you ever so much for joining us today. It's been such a fascinating conversation. I knew it would be with lots of different perspectives. So um, thank you very much to those of you who have, have joined in. And as I said, um, I, I will stay online if my Wi-Fi holds up. <laughs> and um, if anyone's got any other questions, feel free to ask them. Hi, Claire. Oh, go oh. on, Maria. Hi, uh, yes, I'm right here. Um, interestingly, um, on the introvert extrovert thing, I would say that I'm a, particularly in work zone, I'd maybe call myself a cautious extrovert. Um, so it was quite interesting on the on, on the chat side, you know, I love people. If I have a day of talking to people um, and meetings and, you know, I come home energized, I love that side of it. Um, I, I'm doing pretty okay with working from home, but probably because I've had a husband and a, who was furloughed with a toddler, so it was kind of manic during the first amount of lockdown, and I think. Um, but, you know, as a cautious extrovert, I'm not one to jump and say the chat group first off, 
um, and that side of it. So I think, you know, it's, it is interesting the um, still the slight idiosyncrasies between um, and subtle differences between various introverts and extroverts. Um, and I purely have my camera off because I'm currently in the middle of a renovation project. I don't think anyone would <laughs> get too distracted from what, looking at the bare plaster behind me. Um, so I, I was quite interested, you know, and particularly in terms of the kind of um, reaching out to new clients and new contacts, I guess where, where people have found that those successes have lied, as in, has it been through going through LinkedIn and reaching out that way, or has it been other methods of kind of getting that contact information and, and sort of deciding to make that first um, that that first initial contact? I just my sense is that people may be more open to this sort of thing via LinkedIn or does a direct email tend to work better if you can get their email address? Um, so from I'll answer from my perspective, and then if anyone else online has got some thoughts, jump in. I mean, I'm certainly finding it, and I, in fact, I'm going to ask Raya to, to answer. I'm just scrolling through to check that Raya's still there. Um, from my perspective, I'm finding LinkedIn um, much better for those direct approaches than email. Um, there's something about LinkedIn that when you go on there, you go on there in a kind of networking frame of mind. You're going on there because you're looking at either what your connections are doing or to find new connections. So you're kind of in a space where you expect pink people to reach out in a way where you know certainly for me if I get an email it's intrusive I'm you know I might be working I might be doing something else you know and 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 you almost feel you know that you have to answer an email in a way that LinkedIn is is a lot more light-hearted so certainly from my perspective I'm finding it much easier to do to do those approaches on on LinkedIn. Ray I'm going to bring you in because you were talking about sales at the beginning I don't know what you're finding or what your team are finding. Yeah, thanks, Claire. I mean, one thing that we try to do, so in addition to using LinkedIn, which obviously gives you the lovely bit of who do I know, who knows other people that I might want to, to meet. So that's obviously quite powerful. We have an internal tool that allows us to do that as well. So if I were thinking that I wanted to introduce um, Smita, for example, to people at my company, I'm actually able to see if she already knows anyone there, um, or if someone asks me to introduce them to her, I can sort of look and see who might know her, who might be working with her. And so using that technology is, is a really powerful tool because I agree with you a completely unsolicited email it feels really intrusive we all have too many emails and to be honest those are the easiest ones to delete and not worry about um, so I think being able to actually have a personal email from someone saying um, oh Claire you know I met someone who I thought you'd think was really interesting I'm going to send you an email is that okay um, and and you know being able to connect people in that way it's still virtual but but I think that resonates better with people and being able to leverage the technology to look at those relationships and see where we might already have, have a connection with people and, and be able to do that. Where we don't have that in-house, then looking at our LinkedIn profiles and trying to figure out um, how some relationships might work to be able to, to meet people that way, um, I do think that's quite useful. Has anyone else online got a different way of reaching out to, to anyone? Yeah, Claire, it's, it's Oliver here. I was going to make the point that we can meet one person and go for a walk with them. And if you're close enough um, and they're really valuable, that might be an option because they, um, you know, that, that means you're making them a, a really important individual and potential client to you or an existing client. So I wouldn't, you know, in, in they need to be close enough, obviously, but I wouldn't throw that one away because we are allowed to do it. And I, and I go dog walking with, with, you know, local business people, um, and it works, and it's good. So, yes, it, we we can be online, but don't forget we are allowed to go and meet one other person. Yeah, just I think jump in really quickly there, Oliver. I thought that that's a really good point. So, so what we've done, we live quite close to one of our clients, and ordinarily I wouldn't have met up with him for a, you know just a, a quick conversation. It would have been a phone call, but because we are at home and everything is online. Because he's around the corner, actually, I just we just drove around and and had a kind of distance meeting, um, and it was lovely. And then what that's done is cemented that relationship. You know, I think we're in a better place for it. Um, and he, he really, really made the cool. effort. Yeah, yeah exactly. You've, you've called them out as somebody really special to you. So, yeah, selectively it can work. I, th I think is my point. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, and Oliver, you and I have, um, I don't have a dog to walk, but we, we met for coffee um, when that was still allowed. And, you know, and I agree, I think, you know, it's that different degrees thing that Guy was talking about and actually, you know, meeting people, you know, Natalie, we've met for coffee as well. And it does, you know, it does 
make a difference, I think, these days. It's, um, it's a bit of a treat. And even if it's not people that you know through business that you can meet um, for a coffee or a walk, you know, I think just keeping your own friendships and and um, local connections alive like that, you know, just um, some of the mums I see at the school gate and stuff, you know, we'll often just go for a half an hour walk or an hour walk, something after the school run, because we're all craving that personal connection, aren't we? And, and um and just seeing each other and um it was quite funny I went for a, I, I live in North London so I went for a walk around Ali Pally on Sunday morning and there must have been 10 mums I knew from school that we just banged into and it was just so lovely and just being able to smile with each other and just have a, a, a hello and how are you and stuff um was really powerful um and it's so silly because it's just such the simplest thing um but it is it's that personal connection and and I think you know, whether you're introvert or extrovert or working or not working or feeling good about work or not feeling good about work, or whatever, it's just getting that fresh air and just getting out um, is in just kind of building it into your routine. Um, because I think that's obviously one of the big things that has changed is that our routine, getting up at seven, out the door by eight, you know, in the office by nine, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera it looks different now. And, and I think it comes back to one of the points that one of our speakers said earlier, is what happens when people say to you, are you available at that time? We all know we're sitting at home. You know, we all know that, you know, in theory, we could be available to meet them for that coffee or that have that chat or something. So, you know, it does put you onto that kind of tricky situation. But, um, you know, I've heard a lot of, um, control freaks that have said, you know, I have to plan my day like I was in the office as I have to, you know, build in that self-care time or I have to build in those meetings or make sure I have those team calls and stuff like that. And, and even with my husband's work, they're trying to encourage people to have calls because they realize everyone's diaries back to back. So just giving everyone that 10 to 15 minutes. And if that means the meeting runs over or you pop to the bathroom or you grab a sandwich or whatever, you do the school run, who cares? It's just adding in that element of, um, you know, switching around, moving around, getting up from your desk. Um, you know, I think some of the physios must be doing super great at the moment because everyone's at their desk more. You know, you, you're not getting up so much, are you? You're not, even if you're back to back meeting, it's not from meeting to meeting room to desk. You know, you're not doing that physical stuff so much. You're not walking to the tube. You're not up and down the stairs so much um, for good and for bad. But yeah, it's interesting. Thank you. So I know Raya's had to run because she had another meeting. I think what I'm going to do is I'm just going to quickly invite each of the panelists to give me one thing that they're going to take away from today. Um, and then and then we'll we'll wrap up. So I'm going to start with Monica, your one takeaway from today. So um, actually, I, I I don't know if I should be giving a takeaway, but I know I've got something I've got one, yeah. I'm taking away. No, no, I mean, I'm taking away really good point that guy made about a sale. I mean, we, we were a service provider, right? We provide a service. And I, I really thought it's a great point to talk through you know, what value we bring. I know that sounds like 101 and we all kind of know that, but in this climate, it's just, everything just really does feel a little bit more transactional. So just remembering to bring that element in of we team, what, let's walk through the process together. It was like, oh yeah, I remember that from when I started doing this, like, you know, 10 years ago, but we, we just, it's not really something that's been on my mind consciously. And I think that's a takeaway that I'm taking away. I'm, I, I know for sure I'm going to remember that. That's That's been fantastic. And um, yeah, I mean, in terms of what I hope people remember, it's just manage your energy. I mean, just do what you can to kind of get through it. You know, we've talked a bit about the meetings. I know one of the frustrations that I had was in our team, we can all see everybody else's meetings. And so people were booking me in for their meetings and then I would have like back to back to back. And it's not like before where I would have to travel between meetings. So it's literally clicking from one webinar, I mean, you know, one Zoom call to the next Zoom call, which can be quite draining. So, you know, schedule your time. You know, Millie was right to schedule, stick in that 30 minutes. That's my coffee time for me or, you know, whatever it is that you need to get through. So a little bit of self-care is not a bad idea. So I've done probably just, you know, taking one in and, and putting one out. But yeah, that's, that's, that's kind of my takeaway, yeah. Fantastic, Guy. 
Monica might have stolen your takeaway now. <laughs> no, no, no. I, it, it's something we haven't talked about, actually. I, I, I found the whole conversation really interesting. I really enjoyed it, Claire. Thank you very much for organising it. I'm sure everyone else liked it. But the um, one thing that came out in, we was referred to, but not really talked about, was this idea about introverts and extroverts and video calls. And I'm just going to think about that. I know it sounds, uh, what's my takeaway? And my takeaway is I'm going to think about it quite a lot and try and understand what that means and how I can use an understanding to be a better communicator because I treat everybody the same you know I try and make it fun and I try and give them aha moments and that kind of stuff you know that's good yeah but actually I think I could probably be do better in trying to recognize whether somebody is comfortable you know maybe actually Monica's thing about saying look you can turn your camera off I don't care I did have a little <laughs> cheat actually with um and this is going to shock everybody so I do a presentation and I share you know, I do a, a, a team call and I share a presentation and when I share it um I put I bring up two windows because they don't think I can see them anymore but I can and I don't look at my presentation I look at them the whole time and I try and work out whether they like what I'm saying and I try and get the feedback I'd get from a face-to-face -face meeting, that's working, this isn't working. Sorry, I shouldn't, that, you probably all think I'm an awful person now, <laughs> you know, uh, but yeah, no, I, I, I do do that. So I think I've, I'm um, uh, going back to my actual takeaway without trying to be uh, funny. I, um, I think I'm going to think about how I deal with ex introverts with video calls and, um, and I may well invite, for, uh, allow them to turn off their video, invite them, make it easy for them to do that. Okay, thank you. Smita, what's your takeaway for today? Uh, Guy, that was brilliant. I love that in terms of uh, the presentation and the fact that whether they, you know, you're watching them, but you're not. Um, I should try that as well. So I guess that's a takeaway from me. I think one of the takeaways I, I, I want to sort of put for myself is when you have that moment, it's not just something that they can remember you by, but in terms of how you can help them. So something that they've said that may not necessarily have resonated or they may not have articulated or thought about, but from what experiences and skills that you have, what is it that they can think about in terms of giving something back? Because um, I'm all for one in terms of how can I help, some, help someone and be kind to them. So yeah, I think that's, that's the takeaway that I want to instill within myself in terms of continuing to do that with um, the people that I'm connecting with. So thank you, Claire, this has been fantastic this morning. Thank you, thank you to everyone. I've really enjoyed it and I've, I've, I've got lots of takeaways. I'd encourage everyone online just to have a think about uh, the one thing that you're going to take away. And, uh, you know, uh, and actually, uh, you know, Monica and Guy, they're, they're probably my two takeaways as well in terms of value, which, you know, it, it's always the place that you start, but, you know, reflecting on that more often, I think is only, it can only be a good thing. And, and you know, I, I constantly have to remind myself that not everyone's like me. And that's why I like doing these events and bringing different people in, because I think the more that we reflect on that and the more we remind ourselves that people find different things challenging, the more we can leverage the teams that we're in and, and, uh, and yeah, make everything a, a, a nicer place to be, hopefully. So I think that's a really nice note to end on. Thank you ever so much to everyone again for your time this morning. And uh, yeah, hopefully we'll, we'll all see each other for real coffee very soon because I do still miss real coffee. <laughs>